So here in Classics, we're working through the book of Revelation, and today we're coming primarily to chapter 13 um, as we focus on the development of this revelation which God has um, provided for us. We looked at the seal judgments in chapter 6 and 7. The trumpet judgments are laid out in 8 and 9 primarily, and we're um, just now into the first part of the seventh trumpet. We have the angel who came with a little book that was open. Um, we have John given responsibility of measuring the temple and uh, the two witnesses in chapter 11 as we have the unfolding of now this middle <coughs> section uh, of the book here. We're right in the middle as we said before and so chapter 11 we have Jerusalem <coughs> uh, to be trampled underfoot. We have the two witnesses here and the woman is nourished for 1260 days as the seventh angel sounds we have then the signs in heaven the sign of the woman who is clothed with the son who gives birth to a son and whose son is caught up into heaven we had this statement at halftime um, as we looked at it last time in chapter um, just got ahead of myself there uh, in chapter 11 and then in uh, chapter 12 the two great signs that are given to us as we have this sort of um, overview of human history in the microcosm of these two, I take it like holograms, as signs are given to John to uh, understand the battle that's going on. The woman represents the nation of Israel. The dragon, of course, is identified as Satan, the evil one. And then there's war that breaks out in heaven between Michael and his angels. Michael is the archangel and Satan uh, and his angels. And at that point, Satan is thrown down from heaven to the earth and is no longer allowed access to the earth. And that's a signal to him that, um, that the end is approaching. And so when he is unable to do anything to the male child that was born to the woman, then he turns his wrath against the woman and it's given to her in these, um, in these days, the wings of an eagle to fly into the wilderness. Now remember, this is a sign. So she represents the nation of Israel and the wings represent the ability to escape from the, from the dragon and from what Satan is attempting to do. So many of the Jewish people will, will escape as we move into now the second half of the book. So we want to read what follows now in chapter 13 this morning. So if you'll read with me from Revelation 13, verses 1 through 18. And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. <coughs> then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads. And on his horns were ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard. And his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed. And the whole earth was amazed, and followed after the beast. They worshipped the dragon, because he gave his authority to the beast. And, and they worshiped the beast, beast saying, who is like the beast, and who is able to wage war with him? There was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies, and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. All who dwell on earth were worship him, everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. 
If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with a sword, with a sword he must be killed. Here is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. And then I saw another beast coming down out of coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns, like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. And he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose fatal wound was healed. He performs great signs, so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. And he deceived those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and his son to life. And it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he causes all, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, the free men and the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or to sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom that he who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. So, following chapter uh, 12, where we had war in heaven between Michael and his angels, now we come into chapter 13, and we are introduced to this beast that comes up out of the sea. And he is identified as the Antichrist. He is described by John as he sees this beast as having ten heads, seven horns, with blasphemous names written on him. And like he looks like a leopard, like a bear, and like a lion. So various artists had tried to picture him. This is the dragon now on the sand of the seashore as he observes this beast coming up out of the sea. And the beast here has these uh, ten horns and seven heads. And he says, the beast which I saw was like a leopard. So we have a leopard's body here. And the feet were like those of a bear. And the mouth was like the mouth of a lion. So John is trying to describe this grotesque beast that he sees coming up out of the sea to join the dragon. The dragon is Satan. Here's another representation. And this dragon, this beast, as, uh, as is described here, recalls for us the beast in Daniel chapter 7. That beast was described as a horrendous, destructive beast within this little horn that replaces some of the other horns and becomes very prominent. And so it appears that what John is describing is the same beast as described for us in Daniel chapter 7. We're told that one of his heads was cut off and he seemed to receive a, a fatal blow, but then that the fatal wound was healed. And so this beast now receives the authority of the dragon. So Satan is behind all of this. The dragon who stood on the sand of the seashore and who watches this beast emerge. Now, I believe that the, when the breaking of the first seal in Revelation 6, the rider on the white horse was this Antichrist. But now, at the midpoint, now that we're at the three and a half year mark, give or take a little bit, we have this this rider on the white horse identified with a different picture because now his true nature starts to emerge. And we're told that the whole earth followed the beast who worshipped this, uh, who himself worshipped the dragon. So the beast serves Satan and is energized and authoritative by him. 
And so he is given, he displays an arrogant mouth and great authority for 42 months. So either you have to back up, depending on what you do with the timing, we've talked about that in the past, or we are at the midpoint and we have the second 42 months, the second three and a half years in which this beast, <coughs> excuse me, is given this authority. The Apostle Paul described it this way when, uh, when he wrote in 2 Thessalonians. He said, then, he's talking about the day of the Lord cannot begin until the departure takes place and the revealing of the man of sin. And he goes on to say, then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with his breath, the breath of his mouth, and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. So this one is going to be slain at the end when Jesus comes. That is, the one who's coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth. So it was to be saved. So Paul's talking about this in 2 Thessalonians, which is written at about 52, 51 or 52 AD. And John is describing the beast now in, um, in about 95 AD. So we're about 40 years later that this revelation is being given by Jesus as to what's going to transpire on the earth. Um, this is, a, in my judgment, the fulfillment of the prophecy that was given to Daniel all the way back in Daniel chapter 7. You can see the date here, 553 B.C. So now we are 650 years before the prophecy that's given to John here in the book of Revelation. Daniel was told that there were the four beasts, remember, that come up out of the sea, and they're represented by these various kingdoms. And then this is the Roman Empire, and there is a final form of the Roman Empire, which, <coughs> which is this little horn that becomes very prominent on the head of the beast here. And so this is the one that we're talking about now in Revelation chapter 13. He is the Antichrist. He comes out of the revived, apparently revived Roman Empire, or some sort of, of empire that's that's derived from this fourth beast, and he becomes very prominent now at this stage of human history, and he's given this authority. We read in Revelation 13 that it was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him, what we've just read. So this one, this little horn, this now the beast that came up out of the sea and that beast remember resembled all four of these he has the mouth of a lion he looks like a leopard he has the feet of a bear and he has now this prominent arrogant form that comes out of the fourth beast it's interesting what god told daniel back here at 553 what we have written for us about this fourth beast is that John says, I desire to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast, which was different. And he describes him, and then he says down here um, that um, the horns that were on his head and the other horn which came up before the three of them fell, namely the horn which had eyes and a mouth uttering great boasts, and which was larger in appearance than his associates. I kept looking, and that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them, until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one. So, very similar language is given to John. This, this final form of the beast, this horn that becomes very prominent here, is given authority over the saints and to wage war with the saints. So, this Antichrist is seeking to destroy the people of God as he gains authority over the earth. It's interesting, this continues in Daniel 7, and I, I put all of this up here just so you can see the connections that are made. And he goes on to say in Daniel 7, this fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom of the earth, which will be different from all the others. will devour the whole earth, tread it down, and crush it. 
as for the ten horns, out of this kingdom come ten kings, and another will arise after them. He will be different from the previous ones and will subdue the three kings. He will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the Highest One. He will tend to make alterations in times and law. They will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. There's that expression that was used in chapter 12 for the 42 months or the 1260 days for the woman that was to flee into the wilderness. And now we have that same expression, we have it back here in Daniel, a time, times, and half a time. So the 42 months in Revelation chapter 13 is the time, times, and half a time that was prophesied back in Daniel. And so this was laid out in a sort of an abbreviated form in the book of Daniel in this vision that Daniel was given. And then we have amplification of various parts of it by Jesus and by Paul. And now in the book of Revelation, we have the unfolding of the details of what's going to transpire as this beast uh, assumes authority over the earth. It says, but the court will sit for judgment and his dominion will be taken away, annihilated and destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, the dominion, the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and his and the dominion uh, and all the dominions will serve and obey him. So this one is going to be destroyed at the end when the kingdom becomes the kingdom of the saints of the highest one. Now, from the Old Testament perspective, the saints of the highest one would be the Jewish people. right? And so, as we said before, this kingdom that's going to be established is a Jewish kingdom. Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, will come back to defeat this Antichrist and bring about then the kingdom of, uh, of the Messiah. In the series Left Behind, perhaps many of you have read that. Um, if you haven't, you can go back. It's a great series done back in the 2000s, um, late 1990s and 2000s, um, by Jerry Jenkins. Uh, Jerry Jenkins and Tim LaHaye. <coughs> Jerry is the father of um, Dallas. Dallas, right? You know Dallas from The Chosen. So. He's following kind of in the footsteps of his dad. Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins wrote this whole series called the Left Behind series. In their portrayal, they call the Antichrist Nikolai. And Nikolai comes from the Greek verb Niko. We get the word Nike from it. It means victor. It means conqueror. And so this Nikolai is their portrayal of the Antichrist as he comes on the scene. Now, John sees him as a beast coming up out of the sea. And I believe the reason for that is because of the destruction that he brings on the people of God. But he will be someone who is very charismatic. He will be someone who um, brings answers to the world's problems and so forth in the first half of this 70th week. And then in the second half, when Satan realizes his days are numbered, when he's kicked out of heaven, and he turns his wrath now on the saints big time. So the persecution and the tribulation becomes a lot worse in the second half. Because God is judging the earth, and that's going to continue. And added to that, we have the wrath of the dragon, the wrath of Satan, that's turned against all of the believers on the earth. And he seeks to destroy this woman and all of the believers. So, that's the description of the Antichrist. Maybe we should just pause there for a second. I don't know if you have questions or comments. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. So, there's a propensity with this number seven. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm not consoling my numerologist or anything, but my daughter likes to talk about the seven of perfection. So, we have... Not only that, you have a derivative there, six times seven is 42. You have seven horns, seven trumpets, the book of Daniel, uh, chapter seven. Can you comment on, on that? 
at yeah. all. Is there, I mean, is it just, I don't want to use the word coincidental because, you know, we're talking about scripture here, but um, I know Samantha likes to mention, you know, uh, the number seven as representing perfection. Yeah, it, it appears that seven is associated with the perfection of what God is doing. Okay. So we have the seven spirits of God in Revelation that describe the Holy Spirit. We have the seven seals and the seven trumpets and the seven bowls. And so all of these sevens appear to speak to the, um, the perfection of God. And I don't know that we, can, that we can argue a whole lot because we're not told anywhere now seven is the number of God, but it appears to be associated with him and all that he's doing. And of course, the number six is going to be associated with all of this when we get to the end of the chapter here. And believers won't see any of this. We're gone. We're, We're gone. Right. The rapture occurs before all of this happens. Uh, I believe that when Paul says that the day of the Lord cannot begin until the departure occurs first, means that the rapture of the church saints uh, will happen before all of this begins. <clears throat> but Jesus is revealing Everything is going to transpire, all of God's plan for what's going to happen here on the earth. Yes, ma'am. So who's ever left behind is going to see all this? Yes. <coughs> um, Paul makes the statement that people who are left behind, who have heard the gospel and have not responded, will receive a deluding influence, a deceiving influence, <coughs> and it will be difficult for them to um, accept, embrace the gospel. But there will be hundreds of thousands of people, not millions of people, who will be brought to faith in Jesus. And we have seen that in the martyrs that are already in heaven from the tribulation period. We're told clearly that these are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation. So there are many, many people who are who do respond to the grace of God at this time. And that's one of the reasons why we have this all laid out for us, is to see the hand of God in the whole thing. But won't it be too late? No. They'll, suff they'll still suffer going through this time period right. until they are martyred or Jesus brings an end to it. But it's very clear when we get to the end of the seven years that, G that there are thousands of believers on the earth to whom Jesus returns and with whom he sets up the kingdom who are physically alive on the earth. But they will see this. Yeah, they'll have lived through this. Oh, they will see yeah, it. Yeah, they will, they will live through it. Will they get hurt though? I they mean, might. I mean, if they believe Some in will Jesus. die. Some will die. Some will die. Okay. They will suffer. <laughs> As we're going to see in a moment, they're not able to buy and sell. Right. Um, the lamb, the, the dragon rather, the this one, the, the great red dragon, Satan, who authorizes both of these men, is, is turning his wrath against anyone who names the name of Jesus or any Jewish person. And he forces them to accept the mark of the beast, the 666, or else... They die. Yeah. And that's what's happening now in other countries. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah to some Christ, extent. If you say you don't believe in Christ, they kill you. To some extent, that's true. Yeah. Yes. But it's not it's not nearly what it will be in no, this time period. No, it's not, but I'm yeah. saying in a way, it's pretty much the same. Well, there has always been persecution. Yeah. The, the, the 12 apostles, most of them were martyred. Most of them were killed for their faith. Right. And hundreds of thousands of believers down through the ages have been killed for their faith because Satan energizes the forces of this world. He is behind the governments of this world. He is the God of this age, and so he is engaged in seeking to prohibit and to, de to destroy um, the kingdom of God, the church that Jesus is building. But what happens is every time there are people who are martyred for their faith, there are thousands more who come to faith in Jesus. Because Jesus says, the gates of Hades will not prevail against the church that I am building. So in other words, he's given us a chance to believe in him. Yes. The last people who don't believe. Yes. Not me, per se. I believe in Jesus. Okay. <laughs> I, I vote for the yeah. rapture. Yeah. 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 <laughs> 4,000 Jews that flee, they, they, you know, when 
Uh, it says flee when you see the we'll desolation or whatever. We'll and they go to, to the mountains. Is that the hundred? We'll get to them next week. <laughs> okay. All right. Don't run ahead of you. <laughs> yes, Rob. Uh, you said that the, uh, this won't happen until the apostasy or the falling away. Can you explain that again? Because it says here rebellion. Yes. And you. You have the wrong translation. Exactly. <laughs> but uh, in both cases. But in the, when you look it up in this it's, definition, so can you explain that again? Okay, good. Say? Good. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verses one, two, and three it says, "Now with regard to the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the coming of the day of the Lord, let no one deceive you, as if by a letter or a spirit or even if someone claims to speak in our name." For it will not happen unless or until the apostasia occurs first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The apostasia in my Bible is translated apostasy. In your Bible, or your translation that you're using, it's translated rebellion. Rebellion is a horrible translation. Apostasy is at least a transliteration. You know what a transliteration is, right? No. Transliteration is when you take the Greek letters and you just convert the letters to English and you keep the same word. So the Greek word is apostasia. The, the transliteration is apostasy. It just takes the Greek letters and writes them in English letters and uses that word. It doesn't translate. It only transliterates. It changes the letters, but it doesn't tell you what the word means. Right? A translation is where you have the word agape and you then put the word love in. You could use agape, take the Greek letters and translate them to English, and we've used that word enough that we would understand. But occasionally the Bible does that because they struggle with the word. A lot of, some translations have used the word rebellion because they understand apostasia to mean a falling away from the faith. <coughs> In my judgment, that falling away is not a falling away, but it's a catching away. It is, a, it is being caught up, and hence it is a departure. In both cases, it would be departure. And so what we have is the departure of the saints prior to all of these things that happen in Revelation chapter 6 through 18. Right? 6 through 18 is the seven-year tribulation period and the departure of the saints, the apostasy, if you will, occurs first. And that is not a falling away from the faith, it is a moving away from the earth. And so it's a departure of the saints from the earth. And that fits with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where we have the rapture, the catching up of the church saints. All right? Good, good question. Long answer, no short question. I got one more. <laughs> um, the thing where where you said that the mark of the beast, you know, like we're not going to be able to sell or buy or anything, uh, wasn't a president talking about putting a chip in us, in our hand or something? Not too, not too long ago. Different people have talked about <laughs> that at different times. Do you think that that's it? Do you think that this is that 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 is what this? I think it's going to be more visible than that. In, in Revelation chapter 7, the 144,000 received the mark of God on their foreheads. Okay. So now in Revelation chapter 13, the followers of the Antichrist are going to receive the mark of the beast. So it's not, it's not a chip or anything? It's not something that's... It could be, but I don't think so. I think it's more visible than that. Because as soon as I had heard that... I said, that must be the mark of the beast. Yeah, right. A lot of people do. And the answer is we don't know. Right. If it, if it doesn't occur for another 100 years, imagine the technology that will be available in another 100 years. We have no way of knowing exactly how it's going to work. Only that it's going to be clearly a mark of the beast. It's going to be something that is clear that people will need to have in order to buy and sell. So we don't know exactly how it's going to work. All right, um, I think rather than 
continuing on here, we'll wrap it up for today and um, come back next time and we'll look at the beast that comes out of the land. This is the false prophet. This is a religious leader. And then we'll move into what else transpires in chapter 14. We have a number of things, including the 144,000 um, before this, the um, carrying out of the final series of judgments from God. So, um, yes, Russ. Do you think there's a, a chance that a thick-headed like me has a chance to get into heaven? Because <coughs> all this makes my head spin. <laughs> and everybody's head spin. I mean, this is the last part of it. So, what I remember from reading God's word is that you don't get into heaven on the basis of how much of the Bible you understand. <laughs> Thank God. Right? For that. You get into heaven by the grace of the Lord Jesus. Yeah. And and he extends that grace to, to anyone, regardless of the level of understanding, regardless of the level of commitment. He asks us to walk with him. He asks us to study his word. He asks us to try to understand. But... These are signs and symbols, a lot of these things. It's not like he said, you shall love one another, and you have a very specific command that is, I was going to say easy to follow. It's easy to understand. It's not necessarily easy to follow. But some of these, some of these things are difficult of interpretation. And there are good men who disagree. Until the rapture occurs, of course. Um, and then they will all agree with me. <laughs> yes. If it's very brief, yes. It was commendable what you said. Um, I remember Carmel, Carmel, I believe. She mentioned. Oh. <laughs> Again? Two weeks ago, or three weeks ago. Concerning what you just said, how we're called to be encouraging. Especially at this point, that's why we're late because Pastor Matt was talking to me before about how we're going to go to the church and how we're going to reach out and uh, basically call it being hurt. But you, there was an explanation that you gave that I had never heard before. What Norma was trying to say was um, inadvertently was that um, the term that I've heard and you've heard as well um, there were no atheists in the foxhole. Remember when Carmela yeah, was mentioning that. that she was trying to say yeah. that, and your response was wonderful. It was that that is that is based off of fear. That response is based off of fear. So, more importantly, and, and a better perspective is what you had just said: is that if we're called to be encouraging, and um, while we can what we're pushed up against the wall or what we're lying on the ground or what have you. To, can, you I, elab can you elaborate I, on that? I would just say fear is, is wonderful. It does spur people on in a relationship with God sometimes, but it's not enough. And it's the grace of God that brings about salvation and he encourages us to himself to walk with him and to honor him in what we do. All right, we need to, we need to close. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you have all of these things laid out and planned out, and um, you know exactly when the Antichrist will arrive. You know exactly that day when Satan will be cast out of heaven, and then all of these things will start to take place, and the Antichrist will reveal his true form. And you, you have determined, all the way back in the book of Daniel, 2,500 years ago, you wrote that this one would or Daniel wrote the revelation that this one would would wage war with the saints and would have authority over all of the earth but that authority is not final you are the one who is in control uh, that's true ultimately and is also true in our lives today and we thank you for that encourage us by your presence and your power in our lives in Jesus name I pray amen amen, amen. God bless you. Thanks. Thank you. Very good today. I wondered where that went. <laughs>
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be a lot worse. 